Happy Aloha Friday, everybody. Welcome to Stan Energy Man, for lack of a better thing. Welcome to my lunch hour. And uh, we're here today to talk a little bit about some of the interfaces that Hawaii has with outside agencies, outside federal agencies, and outside uh, folks that help us uh, get the information and the data that we need uh, to, to move forward in technology and energy. Um, I started off last week with uh, a stray voltage thing, and I'd like to kind of continue that trend today. Um, as you think about energy, uh, and as I got into this job and started thinking about energy uh, and technology, it, it really starts to open your mind a little bit, and you start to look at energy in different ways. Um, as it, the more I thought about it, even when I was flying fighters, we used energy a lot. An air superiority fighter guy has what we call an energy egg, which he has to constantly be thinking of. And the energy egg, if you can imagine an egg shape, when you're low down at low altitude, your turn radius is really big, like the bottom of the egg. And when you're high altitude and your speed is slow, your turn radius is real small, like the, the small uh, radius on the egg. And believe it or not, the fighter pilot has to think about that because energy is important. For a fighter pilot, energy is life. Speed is life. It keeps him alive. He has to keep going. So we start to think about energy in different ways. It's really important that you really think out of the box on energy. And same with technology. We're, we're moving into an age where technology isn't just computers anymore. Technology is in everything we do. It's in advertising, in, in how we uh, use social media now. It's in farming. It's in uh, manufacturing. It's in every aspect of our lives. So technology is really critical. And the High Tech Development Cor Corporation up in Manoa has a great program for innovators and folks starting off new businesses that help exploit all kinds of technology because now technology, just like energy, is morphing and changing and growing. And we have to start looking at it in different ways. So I'd encourage you to th start thinking about technology, not just as a computer, but also as maybe some other things that have been around a long time, but we're using a different in a different way. I think last week I mentioned like using plug-in vehicles, not just to get battery power off the grid, but to be energy storage on the grid. So those are the kinds of, of things you, you should start thinking about in terms of technology and energy. So today, what I'd like to do is um, talk a little bit about a great place, an awesome place that the state of Hawaii taps into all the time. The energy, state energy office, my office, the University of Hawaii, we, we talk to these folks at a place called NREL the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in Colorado. It's a federally funded laboratory that you're gonna learn all about today and all about the things that they do. And our guest today is Mike Callahan uh, from NREL. And I ran into him on the Big Island uh, a couple weeks ago, maybe a month ago, uh, looking at a gasifier, a small scale gasifier that PACOM was showing on the Big Island demonstrating. And to my surprise, there's an NREL person on, on, in Hawaii, on Oahu. I had no idea, I thought we had the ship him in from Colorado anytime we needed him, but he's here. And uh, he's doing some work locally, and he'll tell us a little bit about that. So welcome, Mike. Glad right. to have you on the show. And why don't you tell us a little bit about where you're from, where you grew up, and, and what got you to Enroll and interested in engineering? Sure. No, thanks. Well, first, let me just thank you so much to be here. Uh, great to be on the show, as well as it's great to be in a place like Hawaii, where you know it's a hub for in energy innovation. There's so many opportunities. There's so many uh, great steps that's already have been taken, and then with some very ambitious goals, notably the 100% renewable energy that recently passed. So you know, I'm thrilled, thrilled to be here, uh, thrilled to be part of the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, uh, and you know, really have, have a good opportunity. So thank you, thank you for the well, opportunity. It's great to have you here. Uh, so yeah, to, to answer your question just a little bit, um, I actually like to start a little bit. I, I um, kind of a, a quick on how I got into energy, and I think. Uh, my, I like to use my story as a quick example for anyone about change and how possible and how change can happen. Uh, so for instance, I, I studied internationally um, long ago in Venezuela and got very interested in international work. Um, and then right out of college, I got an engineering degree and had an opportunity uh, to work with a large company called Exxon. Mm. Uh, so I worked uh, with Exxon and then they merged becoming coming Exxon Mobil and I actually was doing drilling engineering uh, and project management for deep water offshore oil wells off the coast of Africa. Uh, so for years, my responsibility was learning, managing uh, budgets and projects and technologies in the oil industry. Uh, but through that, I saw the challenges with uh, fossil fuel um, and, and to say, obviously, we, we, we use and there's a need and importance, but saw there's also uh, consequences and that uh, using that is a, a time that then we can transition to uh, newer technologies and better 
better ways forward. So uh, decided after that, that experience, I got into actually uh, coming back to the US and working in green building. And at that time, it was the beginning of the leadership in energy and environmental design. And so we worked on some of the very first buildings in that program in the state of Colorado, where I really got experience of the very simple moniker of efficiency first, of mm -hmm. you know, how do you design a good building right from the start. So that's LEED certification? Exactly. Okay. So I so was lucky at that time to become a professional engineer and, and obtain my LEED certification, and then really put it to practice by working on buildings. And it was, uh, this is you know, over 10, 10, 15 years ago, or 10 years ago, uh, and seeing how that industry just really rapidly and how LEED became a standard and, and continued to improve. Uh, so through that, uh, that process and that experience that I gained on working on facilities and in some ways incorporating renewables and others efficient, uh, energy efficient technologies, um, became very interested in that area. And, uh, but then also was always interested in the, the play between the environment and business uh, and return to school to gain uh, an MBA in social entrepreneurship. Um, in that area, I, uh, I'll bring this to a close quickly, but uh, I uh, started working in uh, distributed off-grid renewables. Uh, so I was working in places, um, most predominantly in Peru, uh, where people don't have any access to energy. And so we were using, setting up an organization to distribute solar products to people living off, off the grid. Um, so through all these experiences, I just realized I became very passionate about clean energy and the potential and the benefits of clean energy. Uh, and luckily, being in, in the state of Colorado and, and seeing the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, you know, it's a great campus for about 2,000 people just to the west of Denver, uh, saw this as an opportunity. And at that time, uh, they were looking for people who had experience developing and managing projects and basically helping clients and organizations increase the speed and scale of the development and deployment of technologies and renewable energy and energy efficiency. So uh, that's when I started working with NREL. Okay. Yeah, you bring up a really important point there. We had Joe Pratt here from Sandia Labs last mm -hmm. week, and, and I explained to the audience that, you know, the national labs play a really important part of not just doing research or studies, but the commercialization piece, the part that takes it from the laboratory and turns it into the business, which is what, just what we do here at HTDC and what the state's trying to do in our energy and technology sector is to create jobs and create the new technologies, but it's not easy going from the lab to the, to the commercial world and going into a business. So having folks like you um, in, the, in NREL that have a business background and practical experience and working with big corporations, as well as the engineering and science backgrounds, just is is outstanding resource for us in Hawaii, and, and that's why we tap you so often for for data and reports and and all kind of um, products that you put out and looking at your facilities and the research that you do. Yeah, I, I agree. It's I mean it's a privilege to be here as well, and then working with Enrel, and, and I think that's the partnerships that Enrel tries to to promote. Of uh, we work you know at this laboratory with really unmatched breadth and depth of expertise from the PhDs working on the basic science. The research in terms of how do you make uh, renewable energy, energy efficiency, and electrical systems integration and energy systems integration technologies uh, more cost effective, more durable, uh, reducing the risk for, for the private sector and, and other clients, and, and really working with all these uh, ex experienced scientists, dedicated researchers that are doing the core, and then working with a large group in the middle of, of policy analysts really saying what, what is the impact of these uh, of the technology or policy changes, or really looking into the future, what what types of kind of what if scenarios of what if you do high penetration of wind in, in the whole western part of the U.S. What what needs to change? What needs to happen? Like looking forward, and then in the area where I'm most focused on is the commercialization and deployment and the technology transfer of of uh, the, the innovations from Enrel as well as otherwise of how do we really get uh, existing and newer technologies from that bench laboratory scale, uh, t potentially tested and verified uh, independently at NREL, uh, and then into the field. Uh, and I think there's, there's been good examples of that with NREL. And I think really the, what, what you're alluding to is the partnerships that we're able to, uh, to work with uh, private sector uh, name brand organizations. Raytheon is an example of a bat battery storage project, um, Department of Defense, a lot of federal agencies and the state, um, so, and, and utilities as well. So, we really are, are working in partnership. The, the challenges that are out there are too big to solve uh, uh, solely. So by uh, leveraging all these partnerships and expertise, it really can have a positive impact. Great. So let's take uh, a look. I think we have some still shots of okay. 
the home home drum in Colorado. Great. Uh, Golden Colorado is that where it's at? It's Golden Colorado, which don't is, they make uh, beer there someplace? Uh, they do make. They have one large brewery, which a lot of people, but there's also uh, four microbreweries. Okay. So there's, <laughs> but yeah. All right. Well, tell us about the facilities at Enron and what makes them so special. So I think what. What is really interesting for me for NREL is this, NREL is, uh, as you mentioned, it's a federally funded research, uh, it's an FFRDC, federally funded research um, laboratory. So the Department of Energy owns uh, NREL as they have other laboratories all throughout the U.S. And so these are really jewels and assets for the entire nation. And laboratories are given specific missions and directives. Uh, you mentioned Sandia was on uh, last week and they, they are known for certain areas, uh, whereas NREL's core focus has always been uh, and, and currently is uh, to be the applied laboratory for energy efficiency technologies, renewable energy, and energy systems integration. So our mission is in that space. That's all we focus on. Um, so as I mentioned, we're a large, you can think of it as a, almost like a, a college campus in some ways. We uh, have multiple buildings scattered uh, in a campus uh, area just to the west of Denver, Colorado and Golden, Colorado. Uh, and in that we have, uh, for instance, one of the facilities um, is called the Research Support Facility. Uh, it's one of the largest Class A office buildings to be the most efficient office building in the world. Uh, where it so is, what's its LEED certification? It's uh, platinum. All right. um, and NREL has multiple platinum uh, LEED certified buildings. I think that's an important uh, part of NREL is we walk the talk. Uh, we like to be a living laboratory. So. We test technologies at our own laboratory. Uh, one, for instance, is a, a solar ventilation preheat technology or glass that, uh, as it heats up, uh, will become more obscure to reduce uh, uh, the sunlight penetrating during the summertime to reduce the cooling loads. So there's a lot of fascinating technologies that people can literally visit NREL or the visitor center at NREL and see how these, these technologies, and we actually can take data. So uh, this, this one facility, it's a uh, it's previously been called a net zero building, and meaning that it produces as much energy as it consumes with renewables on, on the building itself and surrounding on the campus. So if I go to Colorado on vacation and I happen to be near, near Golden and, and I stop by Enerol, can I just go in and have a tour of the facility? So there, and the answer is yes, but the timing. So the, okay. the visitor center, and we have a website, and it's really easy, enerol.gov. Um, so there's a great visitor center right at the foot, which is open traditional business hours, and they'll, they'll post their hours so during the week, Monday through Friday, which has a bit of an, a, a, a demonstrations and exhibits on just teaching about this, this national asset and, and what we do at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. They do also uh, periodically have uh, tours. It's not every day depends um, that you're just open to the public. So they'll, you can find out the tour schedule and time your vacation and say, I'd really like to do a tour. Um, to see, as I mentioned, this one facility, uh, the research support facility, is, is a, just a great example of really uh, efficiency first, design, building design, as well as renewables. Um, and the other facility uh, of the, the ones that I think really are, are noteworthy is the, it's called the Energy Systems Integration Facility. And that facility is the, is the newest facility at NREL, and it really is focused on the next challenge of you have there's been amazing strides in the amount of uh, renewable, uh, the, the speed, for instance, of solar development and deployment here in Hawaii and, and, and worldwide. And the challenge then is how do you integrate uh, the changes in solar energy when, say, a cloud passes over, of course, right. when it's nighttime, and you have all these different loads and generation sources all working together. Yeah, I'd like to talk more in detail on that. Yeah. We're going to take a break right now. We're going to take a short break and be right back in a few minutes to uh, our show, my lunchtime show, Stan Energy Man. We'll come back in a little bit. Aloha, I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute and host on Ehana Kako, a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast network. Ehana Kako means let's work together. Think of the sad alternative, let's not work together. Here in Hawaii, with all of our diversity and the richness of the people, it's important for us to come together around issues on the the basis of what's right, and what's good, and what's going to serve the common good. And that's what we try to do at Ehana Kako. Every week we interview movers and shakers, people in government, business, and other sectors of society to talk about how to create together a better government, economy, a better world here in Hawaii that can bless the rest of the world. I thank you for your attention to Think Tech Hawaii, and we look forward to seeing you every Monday 
2 to 3 p.m. on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. We're Ehana Kako, and we wish you well. Aloha. Hey, welcome back to Aloha Friday and Stan Energy Man here. We're talking to Mike Callahan from NREL, and he's given us some insight into how the federal government and the Department of Energy and all the scientists and engineers at NREL are, are helping the state of Hawaii uh, solve problems in, in energy, all kinds of energy. And it's kind of neat because Hawaii is not a big state compared to Texas or California or New York. And really, Hawaii can't afford our own big lab. You know, we do a lot of work at University of Hawaii with HNEI and, and over on the Big Island with Nelha. But to get the real benefit of the, of the scale of, of, what, Nel, uh, of um, what NREL has in Colorado, it's way outside the scope of Hawaii. So we're really glad that we can talk about some of that today. Let's talk a little bit about renewable energy penetrating the grid. Um, we have a, a challenge here in Hawaii. Um, the state of Hawaii encouraged people to go into photovoltaics. We have some wind farms out there. We have, uh, you know, a lot of people that are in Hawaii. We are pretty socially conscious of renewable energy and trying to be clean and green. And just a respect for the, we call the aina, a respect for the, the land and the water and the air. And so there's already a built-in incentive on top of whatever the state has done to incentivize us to renewable energy. But we've already kind of hit that, that kind of stumbling point at about 20% penetration in and about there where now, do batteries make sense to store energy for nighttime, or is, or batteries, do they have limitations? Do we look at other storage technologies? And I know that uh, Michael Penev has done some work in that area for us here in Hawaii, and we're looking forward to hearing from him on some of his ideas. Um, but so what are your thoughts on, on how we start to grow the storage piece uh, for those renewable sources? Well, yeah, you bring up the leading off. I was talking about the energy systems integration facility, and I can you know, talk about a few others. But that that is the the future of uh, you think of a systems approach to energy, and you mentioned storage, and storage is one one piece of of, of the, the the challenge of you know not people immediately think of batteries, but there's also other types of storage, pumped hydro. You mentioned hydrogen, and so storage as a whole is is one component. And mentioning NREL and and what you're saying is. Uh, NREL is an asset for the nation. Uh, our, our facilities are set up to be user facilities. So this new facility, the ESIF, Energy Systems Integration Facility, where organizations, public and private sector organizations, can come and they benefit from having this huge uh, laboratory uh, that they can partner with NREL and run various experiments and tests to look at these challenges uh, without having to build this themselves. So it's you know, people from all over the world literally are doing projects, and we can talk more about the, some of the specifics of the projects later. Uh, another such facility, um, similar, uh, we have, it's 30, about 30 minutes to the north, it's called the National Wind Technology Center, um, has wind turbines from all different sizes, and it's been a, te a test place for uh, wind turbine development, gearboxes and blades, but it also has a grid component uh, called the con controllable grid interface to look at these challenges of how do you have higher and higher penetrations of renewable energy that are intermittent sources with wind, with solar, uh, with the loads, um, and how does that, that all work together in terms of uh, the integration of those so that you still maintain certain uh, power quality requirements to deliver power to consumers and it doesn't create any impacts to their day-to-day -day operations. Yeah, could, could you help the, the audience understand some of the challenges that HECO has to go through here in Hawaii in terms of keeping their power quality up, um, being reliable. I mean, everybody expects when they flip that switch that the power's on, and when they plug in their computer, the lights aren't all going to go brown, and you know, and they want good quality power, and they need it all the time. And the more renewables we have on the grid, the more challenging that is. What makes it so challenging? Yeah, you, you bring up the, you know, the elephant in the room here in Hawaii, and why Hawaii is such an interesting spot, and also compliments uh, to Hawaiian Electric for reaching really uh, people might not realize when looking at the nation hawaii has some of the highest penetrations of solar per capita anywhere if not the highest in the entire u.s so that, that's with a lot of the work that's been done uh, with utility and other partnerships uh, and, the, and the challenges and kind of just ex trying to help explain this is if you can imagine uh, a uh, a bucket of water that's that's flat and it's filled and you have someone pouring water in and someone and the water's going in at the same rate as it's coming out if there's if all of a sudden there's more going out you're not filling up the bucket as fast and if you're 
filling it up too much, that bucket overflows. So it's a very simple analogy of the grid of you always have to be ma balancing, in this case, load and generation, as well as a host of other conditions with voltage and frequency. And so you can imagine this, the island of Hawaii, which has beautiful weather, sun, but it still has clouds that can come, come in, and you have people changing how much energy they use whenever they like, and you have different, you might have a large generator that might be in maintenance or suddenly have a, 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 a fossil fuel generator might have an equipment or other type of generator might have an equipment malfunction. So how to balance all these different sources with different weather uh, patterns, whether the wind stops blowing or whether users suddenly increase, that is really a challenging endeavor. Um, and utilities and the, and the grid has been designed primarily previously to push this energy out. Uh, but now the, the grid, the, the new grid, is how do we then have energy flowing in both directions? How does a utility or other users maybe do what's called demand response or controls remotely to control these loads or their generators or even the, the photovoltaic arrays so they're not generating too much energy and you know, back to that analogy, filling the bucket too quickly or they're using too much. And, and not to mention when uh, a tree or a windstorm comes, you know, fortunately we've missed the hurricane and we'll see that, but you can imagine the challenges, just all these challenges that utilities have. And, and I think Hawaii is a great example of the, the high penetrations that they've been able to achieve this complex system and really advancing the science and the operations uh, to go beyond to these higher and higher penetrations of solar. Okay, so let me ask you a couple more questions okay. then. As, as you get into the study of all these systems, um, are we moving to a time where maybe it makes sense for certain households to be off the grid if they're already rural, if, they're, if they've got more than say a, a quarter mile or a half mile worth of wire running to their house? It just, it's getting to a point where maybe they're better off not being on the grid because the grid becomes a vulnerability? Or are we looking at trying to have systems that maintain a whole grid and, and utilize the power that can, can come inbound from that farm that's way out in the boonies to come back on the grid? I mean, are we looking at all these options or are some better, seem, are panning out better than others or? Um, I, I can say, you know, more instead of like policy, and I'm not, I'm not one to say what should or shouldn't, but what, what can be done and the benefits and you know, the advantages and disadvantages of other. And so off-grid homes have been around for many years. And you know, I've mentioned my experience in working in developing countries. There are many homes that it cost many you know, thousands and thousands of dollars to just string lines that didn't exist. So you think in, in developing countries uh, where you know, they use the analogy of cell phones where if they, many people didn't have landlines, and why would you put in a landline when you can do a cell phone? Right. So in developing countries, the certain conditions, people are considering what's called microgrids. And so do you, in developing areas and, and uh, certain villages, towns, uh, is there some benefits? And so there are organizations around the U.S. Uh, and with uh, looking at these types of microgrids or off-grid, I'm not to say uh, what's, what's right for every, every person, but the interesting part is just that the technology there is technology and uh, that is you, know, you think of a battery uh, renewable generation and it comes down often to uh, policies uh, people's preferences and costs um, but I think the concept that in terms of working together as a whole community that there's benefits of working thinking system-wide as there's so many resources in in Hawaii uh, with wind and solar um, that there's benefits of being tied to the grid uh, if you're living in a downtown location, for instance. But that's not to say that uh, there could be also future advances with microgrid. I know there's utilities in California, for instance, that are the, the utilities themselves are deploying microgrids as a contingency method. So you might have a, a town or this might be remote, uh, and if one tree falls, it puts that town out. So what they'll look right. at is rather than having that risk, why don't they create their own microgrid exactly. with storage, wind, whether it's hydrogen storage, battery storage, so that it gives them more time and it gives that community more resiliency. And so I think, I mean, it's just you know, a fascinating area now with, with as technology advances and costs of solar and batteries decrease of you know, what's possible with technology, then it becomes potentially economically possible. So more and more people are looking at these other options. And the reason I ask that is, you know, a lot of people in the Pacific look to Hawaii. Mm -hmm. A lot of the small island nations look to Hawaii as an example. Mm -hmm. And they're set up with a lot of typhoons rolling through, a lot of... Uh, natural disasters, volcanoes, earthquakes, tsunamis. Mm -hmm. And so their grid, grid is actually a vulnerability. Mm -hmm. So as you mentioned, sometimes, you know, you got to look at those things and say, where does it make sense where you have to establish a big grid mm -hmm. or several microgrids that, that makes sense for that operation? 
And I think in some of our island nations and island communities, um, people are looking at it more seriously and saying, hey, that, that could be what we look at. I think you bring up a good point in the in term energy security. Um, in, obviously, people want low-cost energy and, and uh, has minimal impact on the environment. But increased resiliency is also a big benefit that renewables can play. Um, and one of the reasons I mentioned, uh, hadn't mentioned yet that, that I'm here is I'm actually working with the Department of Navy, uh, who has uh, the stated goal from uh, a, pre a presidential State of the Union address, which is to achieve one gigawatt of renewable energy uh, in uh, basically by the end of this year. Um, the Secretary Mavis, Secretary of the Navy, has also accelerated that. So uh, there's been an office set up called the Renewable Energy Program Office, uh, in which I am here supporting uh, projects, renewable energy projects in island locations under the Navy purview in the Pacific. Uh, so they are very interested not only in the, uh, the benefits of renewable energy, which can be you know, oftentimes cost effective, but that question of energy security and energy resiliency. So that is a, a very important issue as, uh, as we experience now, and, and fortunately just dodging another hurricane recently, uh, that of making sure that we do have sources of power if, if the fuel lines, uh, shipping lines are interrupted for any reason, or if uh, the grid itself is, has challenges, is can you isolate it with microgrids or use local renewable generation assets to be able to provide power during contingency times or even under normal operations. So just so HECO doesn't freak out, you're not doing all that here, right? And while you're, but exactly, that's a good <laughs> point. Yeah, so very, very appreciate the, uh, yeah, the uh, clarification. The, the one gigawatt goal is a goal, it was, a, it was actually one gigawatt, each of the services, you know, Army, Air Force, and Navy, uh, in the, as a presidential address, where President Obama had made uh, that announcement. And so each of the services are pursuing this. So it's three gigawatts in total, uh, and it's worldwide. So uh, the Navy has 70, approximately 70 installations around the world, including 19 uh, roughly uh, Marine Corps installations. So this gigawatt uh, is spread across uh, the opportunities across the world. Uh, and likewise, Army and Air Force are pursuing similar activities. And of course, uh, the military being um, a local presence here and, and has opportunities, uh, there are opportunities for renewable energy development in that area. Yeah, there's a, a lot of people don't realize 10% of our population are military retirees. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I'm one of them, yeah. and I'm, I'm liking that. Yeah. But um, the, all the components here, and US pay commissary, all the components have major headquarters here. Yeah. So um, we know that um, they've been involved in major ways with our state energy office mm -hmm. in promoting uh, renewable energy, photovoltaic, solar water heat. Yeah. And if you look at a lot of the housing, military housing now, you can't look at a house that doesn't have at least solar water heat on it, if not some PV as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, the military has embraced that uh, along with our local community and, and yeah. stepped up to do their share. So, you know, kudos to the Department of Defense and Absolutely. all the components for stepping up. Because yeah. it's, it's every component. The Army's done it, the Navy, yep. the Marine Corps, the mm -hmm. Coast Guard, everyone. Yep. Air Force is, mm -hmm. is, is full in on it as well. Yep. So, well, that's, that's really awesome. Yeah, there's just so many benefits uh, that are potential with renewable energy, whether it be cost savings or uh, it could be future resiliency benefits, uh, stabilizing your energy prices. And so, uh, yeah, it's, it's good to see. And again, the Department of Defense being a uh, a steward of, of this and, and aggressively pursuing these uh, very ambitious goals, uh, but in also in conjunction and in partnership with utilities and with the private sector, um, again, because it's, it's no one organization or, or that can do it, and, and that's what we're here is, you know, we have, NREL has this expertise. I've been fortunate enough to be here to be outreach and to work with local partners uh, to try and, and, and help and provide uh, resources. Okay, great. Well. With that, we're actually going to focus on some of the things that NRL has been doing here in Hawaii in our last segment. So we're going to take a break right now and uh, be back in uh, about a minute or so and uh, talk more energy with NRL and Mike Callahan. So we'll see you in a few. Aloha. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. My name is Josh Green. I'm the host of a program called Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm a physician. I work in the emergency department on the Big Island. I also serve in the state senate, which please don't hold that against me, doesn't detract from my television program. We speak about all the big health care issues in the state. We get together on Tuesdays from 2 o'clock till 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And we try to talk about the most important issues in health care. This is a terrific venue for people to learn about health care. There are many programs on this, on this station. We broadcast it later, uh, not just on the internet, but also on OC16. Thanks for joining us. Please be informed health care consumers. 
Hey, welcome back to Aloha Friday and your power lunch with Stan, the energy man. Um, we're going to start moving into a little bit more locally applicable things that Enerals are doing for us. I mentioned that um, the state energy office and my office at, at HCAT uh, rely heavily on the data that they provide and the studies that they do because they have the resources and that's what they're there for. But Mike's here actually to do some work with the Navy and he's going to tell us a little bit about the things he's doing with the Navy and give us an idea of, of the things that specifically he's working on. So why don't you tell us a little bit, Mike? Great, thanks. Well, thanks again for the opportunity. Um, so as I mentioned, the Navy has the one gigawatt goal uh, worldwide to really accelerate the deployment of renewable energy for the various benefits uh, mentioned of energy security, uh, potential for price stability and cost savings, uh, as well as physical security of having renewable energy assets in, within the Department of Navy and Department of Defense lands. Uh, so they're obviously a, a large landholder. There's a lot of uh, potential for uh, good renewable energy projects. And I think uh, what my group, and this is the, as we mentioned earlier in the show, is focused on project development and finance of how do you help organizations set up projects. So we're, I think oftentimes people have great ideas and there's great opportunities, but then how do they become an actual project? And there's a lot of uh, activities to make sure that the projects are successful that are done in between there. So it could be whether it's environmental work, uh, whether it be uh, confirming cost effectiveness, whether it's the grid integration, uh, interconnection. And again, I'm, I'm one piece of a much larger team of people who, from the Department of Navy, who are very dedicated to this, as well as other consulting firms uh, that are all working on these, these complex issues to really try and set up uh, these take these opportunities ideas and turn them into successful projects and working with a, a myriad of, of stakeholders and team members so uh, as I mentioned I'm primarily focused uh, on uh, opportunities within the Navy organization and installations in the Pacific area so uh, here in Hawaii obviously there's several installations at Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam is the first probably that comes to many people's mind as well as Marine Corps Base Kaneohe uh, then also on the island of Guam uh, and so if you, you know what's happened with Hawaii, uh, there's obviously lots of solar opportunities because of cost effectiveness. And similarly, uh, because of, of uh, the need in the, to import uh, fossil fuel, sure. there's, a, there's a high cost. So there's, a high, there's an opportunity for using renewables to provide other benefits to the Department of Defense. So Yeah, all of our island, island brothers and sisters are afflicted with the same fossil fuel addiction and uh, that we've got to sort of get ourselves away from. Yeah. So, so my, my role here um, has been primarily focused on uh, with the Renewable Energy Program Office led with NAFAC uh, and led by a great team of uh, Navy personnel and NAFAC personnel and working with, through all the different organizations um, and stakeholders here on the island. There's, there's again, a lot, lot more than, uh, than one organization involved uh, to make these projects really be, become uh, best projects for not just the Navy, but the actually benefits for the entire community and everyone living on the island at whole, because we're all, you know, all neighbors and really all working together, you can accomplish, you know, so much more. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that's been primarily my role. I'm not, uh, uh, there, because there's various stages of procurement, there's, uh, there's not details. Can get into a lot of details. I but uh, there's a lot of, there is public information, so people can Google okay. and find out what information is public okay. and, uh, and, and, dis and explore those. Um, I can also talk about, and, uh, the work of NREL and, and my colleagues have done really great work again in this model of partnership uh, working with Hawaiian Electric as well as with uh, one other uh, one specific oh, there's other great solar companies out there this one with Solar City who uh, the Department of Energy uh, and also helped facilitate this and so this goes back to our earlier discussion which was really looking at high penetration of solar uh, on the grid and the technical challenges that we, we briefly discussed and that's where I want to focus is there's other questions of cost and policies but really what NREL and in this state is just focusing on the technology and the testing and, and us being a neutral third party mm -hmm. validator tester so in this case uh, Hawaiian Electric had done many great much great work in terms of looking at modeling of these high penetration scenarios uh, but really to physically test equipment in a laboratory uh, and in this case inverters an inverter is a a part of a, a, a solar array converting the DC power to AC power right. and has many other features. Um, so we're really wanting to look at uh, as you get higher and higher levels of penetration, uh, what happens if there's a fault in the system? And there's, the specific case is called transient overvoltage. And uh, there's a full public report on this that people could also find. 
but uh, it was really looking at this specific case. And there might be, uh, might, there's a, a great video that we maybe could take a quick look at that gives yeah. an overview of that, and then I can follow up. Great. With the film. Yeah, let's, let's cue the video and, uh, and let folks uh, listen to the, uh, the professionally done uh, description of the, the project that Mike's talking about. The growth of distributed energy resources is becoming real and tangible. Solar technologies, particularly those distributed rooftop PV solar technologies, add a lot of variability to the energy supply coming onto the grid. Reliability has been one of the highest responsibilities or roles of utilities. They have to deliver reliable energy to their customers. Folks that have PV on their rooftops want to make sure at the end of the day that they still have a resilient energy efficient system. The Energy Systems Integration Facility is the only place in the country that has utility scale capabilities in terms of testing and validation. Companies that are out there providing power to consumers don't want to experiment with that. They don't want to experiment with their own systems. And so the ESIF offers them a place just like their own to do the work that will advance clean, affordable, and reliable power. Putting actual devices that we use in the field yeah, into a live circuit in NREL and doing simulation around it is a capability we can't do anywhere else. NREL partnered with SolarCity and HECO to bring together a provider of solar technologies and advanced power electronics and inverters with a utility that had real concerns about operating their grid. Solar City came into the Energy Systems Integration Facility. They wanted to better understand how smart inverters would play with Hawaiian Electric. And as an integrator, they wanted to make sure that what they were promoting and what technology they were trying to push forward was actually sound and valid. So we have five research projects with NREL. The first one is, is completed and the results are done and, and it's had a tangible impact uh, in the industry and specifically in, in Hawaii already. Uh, the test relates to a, a term called transient over voltage and that was essentially a limiting factor that a Hawaiian electric company was, was concerned about as far as installing distributed energy resources uh, on their grid. Once the results came back, it basically said that transient over voltage was not the limiting factor that uh, we thought it might be. For a technical perspective, it was not the limiting factor on the grid anymore in Hawaii. We have these specific results in Hawaii we anticipate and we're getting the interest to take those results, apply them to utilities across the country. Utilities are reaching out, they're asking about it, and there's an appetite to revisit these limits. I'm a big believer in collaboration. This sort of collaboration, collaboration with utilities, distributed energy resource providers like Solar City and National Labs like NREL, it's critical because of the pace of change in the industry. NREL can be that convening authority, that facilitator for these collaborations to bring groups together in ways that they may not individually do on their own. I think this is absolutely the beginning of a new paradigm for relationships on tackling these really challenging topics in the grid. We hope that bringing industry partners, the utility folks together with our staff, our energy systems integration facility uh, capabilities, all the research teams will be able to have that much further impact towards the smart grid of the future. The grid is evolving and it's one of the biggest assets we have as a country and to change that, to bring in new technology, to engage new consumers and doing all this in an equitable way that reduces carbon and, and supports the, the environment. It's a whole set of large audacious goals that, that are incredible to work on. So looking at that video, there's two big takeaways. The biggest one for Hawaii is all of you folks that were stuck in the queue with HECO and, and were waiting for the answer, NREL helped come up with that answer. And that video is a direct, uh, a direct effect on Hawaii's grid in that right after NREL did that, that demonstration and study, uh, HECO came back and started allowing more solar penetration onto the grid as a direct result. The other thing to take away is that it was stated in the video, and other grids are learning from what HECO did. So not only did we take care of a backlog of the folks on the renewable side here in Hawaii, but we helped other utilities and other states move forward in their ability to use more, more solar penetration, more renewables on their grid. So keep on going with talking about this, uh, this project. Yeah, I think you hit the two great, great takeaways and the, the other overarching, and I think the theme is that 
this really is a partnership with many organizations, uh, Hawaiian Electric locally, and, and really you know, a local solution. And they had done, as I mentioned, a lot of great work with modeling. But it just doesn't make sense to go build a multi-million dollar new facility and lab when you can go use one other location. And so each person had a certain, each organization had a certain benefit and in, in, in part of that teamwork. You know, just like you have a, a football team or any type of team, each person has a certain role. And so that's what NREL's best role was, as being that laboratory neutral, unbiased, uh, credible resource of people with experience in this and with the tools and equipment to be able to work with, uh, and this was, it was a large industry partnership from the inverter manufacturers themselves who also were playing into defining what the testing protocol would be uh, and providing their inverters at, their, at no cost as well to be tested uh, in this facility to really work uh, with the utility to, to meet utility objectives uh, with the solar developer in this case, but the, the work that's done here not doesn't just benefit one. And I think that that's the, the, the really good news story here is that this national asset, the investment then pays off, it benefits the industry as a whole, it benefits the people in the state of Hawaii, uh, utilities all. Uh, and then your point of that really this, again, Hawaiian Electric, what they've done in here in Hawaii with the highest penetrations of PV in the nation, that the lessons that are being learned here, the innovations and, and technology, uh, and then can be replicated throughout the U.S. and really the world as more and more locations to try and pursue uh, these you know, and get closer towards these higher penetrations. So again, I think it's a really, really good example. And it's just one that's particularly important here. As you mentioned, there is you know, a queue with literally thousands of, of applications waiting at that time of a limit of a 120% uh, penetration limit. Uh, but then Hawaiian Electric made their own uh, choice using the, the the, basically the data and the results of this analysis to increase that level to 250% subject to meeting other requirements with uh, technical requirements on the inverters. So really had an immediate market impact, an immediate benefit, and as uh, was mentioned in the video, this is a, a one of five steps um, in this analysis. This was on the topic of transient overvoltage, um, and uh, there's other steps, uh, ground forward ultra overvoltage, uh, looking as inverters as a resource, a distributed resource, or anti-islanding. So there's all these other issues and challenges. This is, as uh, one of the members mentioned, just an exciting part, first step of really by working together collaboratively as a group with different actors, you can start solving these challenges, have positive benefit that really benefits, and the benefits are much greater by, by having this discussion and, and, and working together. Great. And I'm, I'm really happy, and I think the people of Hawaii are happy that Hawaiian Electric has reached out mm -hmm. uh, to take advantage of the NREL resource because as was mentioned in the video, uh, you can't exactly go in your garage and replicate a, a whole entire grid impact. Uh, and you can only do so much with computers and model things. Sometimes you have to actually let the electrons flow and, and put some serious uh, kinks in the system to see what really happens. And that's where the rubber meets the road and you really solve the problem. So that's the kind of place NREL is. It's not just a, a small little lab. It's a, it's a big institution mm -hmm. with some great resources and assets that let us test things on huge scales mm -hmm. that aren't, aren't, we aren't able to test here in Hawaii or even, even model here in Hawaii efficiently. So we're, we're just, believe it or not, just about out of time. And I want to thank you for coming in and talking to us. And, I, and I'd like to come back when you can talk more about some of your Navy projects, uh, maybe as we move farther down the road here. So I uh, hope you can come back and share some of that with us. But we're looking forward to uh, what NREL has in store for the Navy. Uh, maybe you can help me with the Air Force a little bit. And, uh, and we'll do a lot more here in Hawaii with NREL. So thanks, Mike, for coming in and, and joining us on, uh, on Friday. And thanks to everybody else for staying with us for 45 minutes on your lunch hour and, and spending some time with us to learn about NREL and all that they do for Hawaii, HECO, and, and everybody here that's trying to put PV on the roof. So thanks. We'll see you next time. Aloha. <laughs>